Praise the Lord. Good to see you all. Good evening. What do we usually say? Good evening, Hope Reform Baptist Church. There we are. Open your Bibles up to the book of Revelation. We are celebrating today. It's been said, I don't mind repeating it. We are celebrating today 16 years and one day since the Lord uh, uh, opened uh, the Hope Churches. It wasn't Hope Church back then. I think Springwood Christian Church or something. And it wasn't much of a church. It was only three people, but Praise God and hallelujah, uh, the Lord grew it and here we are today, 16 years ago that Hope Church started and we pray to God for much more usefulness in His kingdom and many more years ahead of us, amen? amen. Revelation chapter 1 is our passage tonight. If you are just joining us for the first time or maybe you're visiting, we usually preach through books of the Bible, but we have taken this sort of quarter to go through uh, thematically ideas about the atonement of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, specifically by looking at those passages which name the blood of Jesus and tell us specifically what the blood of Jesus accomplishes for us, or what it gives to us, what what benefits it it, uh, uh, grants to us by the grace of our wonderful God and Savior. And tonight our consideration is in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 uh, and 6, and it is the understanding that we are freed From our sins, by his blood, what good news. Look at verse uh, uh, 4, after the sentence regarding John, starting with grace to you. Revelation is ultimately a, a very long letter filled with all kinds of visions and revelations about Jesus that John was commissioned to write to suffering churches under persecution in the first century. Here's how it starts, and this is just the beginning of what is an amazing book. Nonetheless, this is our portion tonight. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. That is the eternal one. That is the language of the Father. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Seven in the book of Revelation is a number regarding fullness. That is the fullness of the spirit who is before the Father's throne. That is Father and Spirit. Verse 5 then says, and from Jesus Christ. So before we get into it, even at the get-go in the passage, we're not supposed to be exegeting, but you asked for it, so here it is. Uh, The grace and the peace that comes to us as believers in Jesus is not just Jesus' grace and peace, is not just apostolic grace and peace, is not just communal grace and peace. It is grace and peace that is given to us and granted to us from the triune God. Father, Son, and Spirit have joined themselves into covenant with mankind to graciously give us peace where there used to be enmity. There is grace and there is peace from the Father, from the Spirit, from the Son. And now he goes to uh, modify, condition, explain, give um, uh, 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 additional information about who this Jesus Christ is. He says this in verse 5. From Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, verse 6, and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Got to give it more gusto than that when we're reading Revelation. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. That is the doxology of John that is usually at the end of the book. But he can't wait to get to the end of this 22 chapter book. He has to give it to us straight here. To Jesus, the the one who is the the, the theme, the the core, the, the seed, the main idea of the entirety of the book of Revelation with all of its confusions and numbers and visions, ultimately at its core is an opening up, a revealing of Jesus Christ himself to the church to grant grace and peace. And he is the king of all kings. Tonight, as we look at this, I want to return to something that is a frequent uh, a study of ours, and we can never fully exhaust its, its uh, consideration. Spurgeon said there's, there's certain things in the world that they wear down with use. Think of your great-grandparents' uh, old wooden staircase, and maybe in the middle there's chipping panels, or there's a wear in maybe a carpet where your mother has always kept uh, one of her wardrobes maybe, and there's a wear, right? Uh, frequent use creates wear. And then there's some things, some precious stones in creation, which frequent use actually increases its, uh, its shine, 
It's like gold, like silver, like, like gems. The more you rub it, it doesn't wear down. It shines the brighter. And this mystery, this revelation about Jesus as the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, or if I can say it another way, the revelation of Jesus as prophet, as priest, and as king is one of those uh, examples of things that the more we study it, the more brightly it shines. I hope even if you've heard me give one of my hour and a half going on seven hour lectures around Christ in his threefold office, I hope that you're not switching off now thinking, you already know this. I hope that like John, you're bending the knee, opening your heart, reaching your arms to heaven and saying, reveal more, Jesus Christ. Give me more peace and grace about this wonderful truth that is Jesus in his threefold office and how he loves us and frees us from our sins by his blood. So look at this. In, uh, we'll come back to Revelation, but go with me uh, quickly to Hebrews chapter 1. If you're new and you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you one. There should be one out on the uh, uh, bookshelf out there. Otherwise, uh, you can uh, uh, borrow the mates next to you. I promise you, they'll give it to you. Uh, he Hebrews chapter 1, we see this same idea. And here's the big idea. Jesus manifests in his mediatorial office, mediator being the ability to bring two parties together. In the Old Testament, the, uh, 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 the idea is shown to us that God and man are estranged by sin and so God appoints, uh, really it was the Levites who were the priests. They were the mediators between God and man. Now, there are three main types of mediators in the Old Testament. There are, uh, and by mediator, we mean somebody appointed and anointed by God to bring God and man together in some facet and in some regard. There were prophets in the Old Testament who mediated God's word to the people. They represented God to the people by speaking his words. That was a prophet. We also have priests mentioned earlier. And the priests were not to represent God to man, but represent man to God. And so pray and speak for man. Pray and ask for mercy for man and make a sacrifice to atone for the sin of man. Prophets spoke from God. A priest spoke to God from man. And then there is the anointed and appointed office of king in the Old Testament. And they would mediate God's rule and his reign and his justice and his protection over the people of God. And these three main offices in the Old Testament, we see the New Testament writers and the apostles pick up these themes and say, they all coalesce in Jesus. He is not just a priest, he wasn't even a Levite. He's not just a king, though he was from the royal tribe of Judah. And he is not just a prophet. He is the ultimate prophet. He is the ultimate priest. And he is the ultimate king. And we see this not only in Revelation 1, but also in Hebrews chapter 1. Look at Hebrews chapter 1. And in verse 1, it says, Long ago, that's the Old Testament, at many times, that is all the way from Adam in the garden and the curse, all the way through to Malachi in Israel, at many times and in many ways, sometimes speaking through angels, sometimes people, sometimes pagan priests, sometimes pagan kings, sometimes donkeys. In many strange ways, God has spoken to our fathers, he says, by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things. So, so the writer of the Hebrews says, at the very beginning of the book, we had many prophets who spoke many things in many ways, but primarily the greatest prophet who has come to us very recently is Jesus Christ, God's Son. Not merely sent from God, but himself God, God's Son. That is significant. He then goes on to say in verse 3, look at verse 3, he says, uh, towards the end of the, that verse, the second sentence, it says, after making purifications for sins, comma, so here the writer of Hebrews sees him also as the purifier of the people through sacrifice. So, so he also fulfills the priestly office. After making purification for sins, what does he do next? He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That is, that all of the Old Testament language about the coming king who would sit on the throne next to his father. That 
that he would sit on God's throne. And it, it felt almost blasphemous as you read those prophecies to think of a human, a son of man, sitting on a divine throne. But as they coalesce in the ministry and the life of Jesus, we see, of course, he is man, a son of man. But he's also son of God. And so that divine ruler, king, over all other kings, he's going to be called the son of man, the Messiah, and he is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Jesus is the king of kings. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Therefore, the writer of Hebrews tells us Jesus is prophet, he's priest, and he is king. I also ask you to turn to Psalm 89. (coughs) Psalm 89. And here we have another, what they call messianic psalm. A Davidic psalm written by uh, uh, David. Uh, largely about David and his sons, but ultimately about Jesus Christ, the greatest and final, as far as things matter, son of David of the royal line. Psalm 89, uh, you can look at verse 27. We'll go there in just a moment. But this psalm is all about there being a future king from the line of David who will be greater than David. Now, that's pretty hard to imagine. Because at the time of David, there was no king greater than David. The only other Israelite king they could compare him with was Saul, and he was a piece of work. Uh, David was the great king. Uh, he was just like God. He, he, he defeated the Jebusites and took Jerusalem and established a kingdom in a, in a main city up on Mount Zion. What, a, what an amazing king we have. King David, he, he slew the Philistines. As, as just a boy, he killed their champion Goliath. I mean, this is a king born for greatness par excellence. And yet, he would have a, a descendant that would be better than David, more righteous than David, blessed of God more than David. He would have a king that would a kingdom that would not end, and a kingdom so expansive and so glorious that all peoples would worship him. And, and we might think, well, wasn't that speaking of Solomon, David's son, who extended the borders? No, I said more righteous than David. Were you listening? Not an idolater. Uh, not not a, an adulterer, ultimate, multiple hundreds and hundreds of wives bending down in pagan worship and orgies to false demon gods. Not Solomon. He, didn't, he, he fulfilled parts of it. He built a temple, sure. Not the ultimate temple. Not the eternal kingdom. He also died in sin, died, and therefore did not rule forever and ever. So, so this psalm, it, it sprinkled on David. It, it splashed a little on Solomon, but it was ultimately waiting for somebody else to come. And that psalm points ultimately to Jesus Christ. Look at verse 27. God says of this king, he says, I will make him the firstborn. Firstborn in Hebrew literature and understanding means uh, the inheritor of the estate. My firstborn is the one, sometimes not even the one born first. It could be an adopted firstborn. It could be my second child who is a son, who is then, you know, his older sister doesn't really count legally in inheritance back then. And, and so he would be the firstborn. The point is that he would receive the inheritance of all things and everything belongs to him. Everything is made for him, my firstborn. So God is saying, he will be, to, I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. That is a king above other kings who gets to tell other kings what to do. That's a real king. Then look at verse 36. His offspring shall endure forever. His throne as long as the sun before me. There was coming a king whose kingdom signified by his throne, his rule, his reign, would last as long as the created order. It would not be broken down by the Chaldeans or the Babylonians or the Persians or the Medes or the Greeks or the Romans or the Palestinians. No, this kingdom, this throne would be established and immovable for all generations until the sun is no more. I wonder, as you probably wonder, who who could that be speaking about? Hmm. If I got some hands, I'm sure I'd get the right answer. Jesus Christ, of course. Verse 36 says, His throne will stand as long as the sun before me. Verse 37, Like the moon, it shall be established forever, a faithful witness in the skies. 
That is, when this king rules and reigns, his throne in its existence and its immovability, his rule and reign will speak about God. It will be a faithful witness. This king and his throne and his rule and his reign will be a faithful message to all the world. And these are the exact phrases picked up in Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. Go back to chapter 1 verse 5 and you will see Psalm 89 intentionally quoted by John. Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, whose rule and reign is a testimony to all the world, which will never pass away. It will not last until the end of the sun, but it will outlive the sun, Jesus' throne. Jesus is the faithful witness. He is the firstborn, as Psalm 89 said. He is the firstborn of the dead, which is a New Testament spin on the prophecy. And the ruler of kings on earth, just as Psalm 89 said, the Davidic king to come would be the uh, uh, highest of kings on earth. So the apostles, John the apostle here, speaking uh, as the Spirit gave him utterance, the apostles' basic assumption, which no doubt they learned from Jesus after his resurrection. Jesus raised He met them and he taught to them, Luke 24 tells us. He just goes and does an Old Testament Bible study and shows to them how the Messiah had to die, be crucified, then rise on the third day, then inherit a kingdom. And he explains all of that from the Old Testament, from Genesis all the way through to Malachi. The historical books, the stories, the prophets, the poetic uh, songs and psalms. Jesus taught the apostles how to read the Old Testament. And the apostles' basic assumption from Jesus was that Christ had accomplished all the salvation that was promised through the many diverse, varied prophets of the Old Testament. Jesus is the fulfillment and the accomplishment of everything that the Old Testament pointed to and had inherited for himself these glorious promises that Psalm 89 says. These promises said one would come, Jesus arrived. It said that One would be blessed of God to thwart his enemies. And Jesus died for sin and was consumed by death so that he might defeat sin and defeat death, the great Goliath who he struck. Psalm 89 said that he would have a kingdom and an offspring from all nations and all peoples. And that is what Jesus Christ has and has ransomed by his blood. And all those who are saved by Jesus are therefore, speaking in Psalm 89 language, in the Davidic, glorious, holy kingdom. So Revelation 1. Let's, let's start pinning down these three meanings. Jesus is our prophet. Jesus is our priest. Jesus is our king. First of all, uh, verse 5 calls Jesus the faithful witness. That is the language of a messenger, a speaker. And he speaks about God. He speaks to mankind perfectly and clearly and truly and graciously and ultimately and finally as well. That is why Jesus is a prophet. Uh, In John chapter 4, the woman at the well in Samaria that Jesus was meeting with, uh, she says, I perceive that you're a prophet. She was right. Then she says, I know the anointed Messiah will come. And Jesus says, regarding the prophet claim, regarding the Messiah claim, he says, I who speak to you am he. I am the prophet. I am the Christ. I am the anointed one. In Matthew 5, we see this comparison, this intentional comparison on the part of Matthew to connect Jesus to Moses and show Jesus as greater than Moses. So Moses, right? Remember Exodus. Moses liberates people through water, and then they wander in the wilderness. Jesus goes and is baptized among the Israelites in water, and then goes out into the wilderness and does battle with Satan and wins. Moses went up onto the mountain for 40 days and fasted in God's presence. Jesus, after his baptism, went out into the desert, driven by the Holy Spirit, to be tempted, and he fasted for 40 days, not 40 years. That would have extended the whole timeline out, would have thrown off the prophecies. 40 days will be enough to uh, uh, symbolically uh, compare to Moses uh, 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 wandering in the wilderness, but matching exactly how long he spent up on the mountain. Moses then came down the mountain and spoke over the Israelites the new law that God gave. Jesus goes up onto a mountain and delivers the most famous sermon in all of human history, the Sermon on the Mount. He says, blessed are those who, blessed are those who, blessed are those who. He teaches 
the best divinely inspired and perfect interpretation of God's law that had never been known before. Moses gave the law. Jesus comes as a perfect inspired explanation and application of God's law. That's what the Beatitudes are. And the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus, like the prophets of old, come up to the idolatrous, blasphemous temple where the Jews were in the Old Testament. They were worshipping other gods. They had uh, 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 cultic prostitutes of other religions inside their temple, drinking blood of pigs and things. We see Isaiah and Ezekiel uh, condemn this paganizing of God's temple. Jesus also comes up to the temple as a prophet. And while they were monotheistic at that point, they were more devoted to the God of Abraham, so they thought, yet they had uh, become self-righteous and they had erred in other ways. And so Jesus, just like Isaiah, just like Ezekiel, just like the other prophets, delivered woes upon the people. The prophets of the Old Testament would say, Woe to you, Israel! Woe to you, Judah! Woe to you, uh, priests and leaders! Woe to you, false shepherds! Which means woe means God's judgment be upon you, a cursing. And Jesus comes into the temple, Matthew 23, and, and he starts saying, Woe to the scribes! Woe to the Pharisees! Woe to you, Sadducees! Woe to you, false teachers! Woe to you, false leaders! Because he's the ultimate scathing prophet sent from God to reveal the people's sin and properly and perfectly exegete God's law for them. And so John chapter 1 verse 14 says, not only that God's Son brought the Word, but that God's Son literally is the Word of the Father. Eternally begotten, not made, but the full and true essence of the Father and the perfect manifestation of the Father's self-knowledge. He is the Word, the Logos, the truth of God personified in the eternal, divine, triune a member of the Trinity in the Son. So John 1 verse 14 says, That Word, that Logos, became flesh and dwelt among us. Not just that a messenger came to speak about the Word. The Word itself, the message itself, put on human flesh. This is prophecy beyond all other prophecy. And then John says, and so we have seen his glory, glory as the only son from the Father. That is through Jesus' manifestation, we see the glory of the Father, which no other prophet could usher in for us. Verse 17 then says, the law was given through Moses. Now, is there anything wrong with the law? Let me hear you. Is there anything wrong with God's law? Absolutely not. It is perfect. It is inspired. It's beautiful. It's glorious. It's heavenly. It just condemns every single person who reads it because none of us can fulfill it. Therefore, it is a useless way of salvation. So as far as salvation, is the law any good? <laughs> no. No, inspired by God, perfect, but not meant for salvation. Does the law reveal to us God's righteousness? Bit of a, a bit of back and forth. Does the law reveal to us God's righteousness? Does the law reveal to us and gift to us an imputed righteousness? No, it does not. The law came through Moses, which was wonderful and glorious, and Moses was the prophet par excellence of the Old Testament. But grace and truth, John says, came through Jesus Christ. That is that truth came through Moses, but partial truth. Truth about sin, truth about law, truth about justice. But he could not usher us into a right standing with God by that law. Therefore, the fulfillment of the truth had to be revealed, and that came through Jesus. And did he mention that it comes with grace? Verse 18 then says in John chapter 1, No one has ever seen God, we could put in the word, but the only God who is at the Father's side, he has exposited him. Or in the ESV, he has made him known. This is a prophet among all prophets, above all prophets, beyond all prophets. This is Jesus. God's Son, fully God. To see the Son is to see the Father. Jesus said this, to know the Son is to know the Father. No Old Testament prophet could ever say. And if they did, they would be buried under a pile of rocks larger than Mount Everest. No prophet of the Old Testament could ever say, oh, to look upon me is to look upon Yahweh. Height of hubris, blasphemy, breaking of the law. Jesus literally said that to his followers. To look upon me is to look upon Yahweh. 
If you've known me, you've known Yahweh, the full essence of God, self-existing eternally in my person, which has taken upon human incarnation and body, flesh, mind, soul for your salvation. To know Jesus, to see Jesus, to hear Jesus is to know God. That is why he is the faithful witness. And then he is a priest. Look at uh, Revelation chapter 1. He is a priest. Where where do you see priestly language here in verse 5 of Revelation chapter 1? It's here that he is called the firstborn of the dead. The firstborn of the dead. Which means that he was dead. Like the sacrifices. Jesus was dead, having given himself up for sacrifice for sin. And then Jesus is no longer dead because we can't worship a dead mediator. We don't have a dead mediator. But we will forever, forever, forever and ever worship a crucified mediator. We worship a once dead, now alive mediator. Jesus will never stop being the crucified one, though he came off the cross into the grave and into glorious life two millennia ago. He will always be the crucified one, for he was crucified. But he will not always be the dead one, because he's not just a martyr. He was the glorious son of God, given in sacrifice, to then rise again and defeat death, and then end all sacrifices. Firstborn from the dead. Firstborn doesn't mean, as your Aryan friends might tell you, they're Jehovah's Witnesses, Aryans, the classic old heresy delivered, dealt with in the 300s. They're still going around. The Aryan friends of yours will knock on your door too early in the morning. You need to get pit bulls, put them in the front yard, and they will tell you that Jesus is firstborn, right? He was the first created thing. You just have to tell them they don't understand Hebrew, Greek, the Bible, anything. Jesus is not firstborn, meaning he was the first thing made. He is firstborn in the sense that all made things, which are made by him, Paul says, are made for him. All of creation is his inheritance. All of creation is his kingdom. All of his creation is his gift from the Father. He is the firstborn of creation, as Colossians 1 says. He is the firstborn in the sense that he is the beginning of the new creation, We will all, the the just saints made perfect, those who will inherit the new heaven and the new earth, we will all be resurrected and that will be us partaking in the the fullness of the new creation, the new realm of creation, the next round of uh, imperishable, uh, unstainable uh, creation which will not fall. There will be no Garden of Eden repeat. It will be sealed in righteousness, fully clothed, not, not naked and able to sin. We will all partake in that, but who is the first one who ever resurrected? Where is the first emblance and where is the first uh, 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 deposit of the atoms and the cells of life that will make up the new creation? It's in the body of Jesus Christ. He's the only portion of all physical matter that exists in the stuff made of the new creation. The rest of us are all old creation. Everything else you touch and see and smell is old creation stuff. Only he is made of the purified, cleansed, and renovated, resurrected, glorified flesh. Jesus is the first moment of the resurrection of the new creation. That's what it means, that he's the firstborn from the dead. But also firstborn from the dead means that he is the one who makes the successful atonement. He is the one who makes the successful atonement. We've, we've said this before, and I, I will repeat it, that anybody, including Jesus, could claim to fulfill the Old Testament. They could claim to be perfect. They could claim to be the Son of God. They could claim to be fulfilling all of the Psalm 89 prophecies. They could quote Psalm 110 like Jesus loved to do. Oh, Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies uh, uh, footstools under your feet. Anybody can claim that and apply that to themselves in a narcissistic piece of hermeneutics. Anybody can do that. Anybody can die and in dying claim that I am in this moment offering my soul upon the altar of the heavenly holy place to the Father and into his hands I commit my spirit. Anybody could claim that. The proof of whether or not that invisible transaction was actually occurring between Father and Son, between God and Mediator, is whether or not he stays dead. Because to be dead is to be under the rule of death. 
To be dead is to be under the punishment of sin, meaning you're not perfect, you're not the holy one, you're not the Messiah, you're a crazy man, I'm glad they killed you. And others had come and claimed those things. Jesus' claims were perfected, were fulfilled, were proven in his resurrection. They were a vindication. His resurrection was a vindication of everything said over him and an undoing of all of the cursings he heaped upon him by humanity in his shameful humiliation on Easter Friday and Saturday. Jesus' resurrection, therefore, proves necessarily that Jesus the Christ is no longer under the claims of death because he was perfect. He is no longer under the curse of sin because the Father has discharged that debt in his death and therefore he may rise again. Jesus, by resurrecting, has therefore proven that he is the great high priest who went into the holy place and came out alive. Leviticus 16, the Day of Atonement, we've studied it a lot in this blood series. One day a year, the high priest only, the highest sort of head chief guy of the Levites of Aaron's sons, a very specific lineage, he was allowed, if he did all the sacrifices perfectly, rightly, in all of the washings, if he did it all, he alone could go into the holy place, the big temple, and then into the second curtain, the holy of holies, after lighting the incense to shield the invisibility of God, because even the invisibility of God should not be looked upon, and sprinkle the bowl of blood upon the altar where the law of God was held, upon the mercy seat, the place of atonement and propitiation. And if he did it right, he would leave there, he would come out, and upon the people's sight of the high priest, they would, they would declare, our sins forgiven, another year of mercy, praise God and hallelujah, go your way and have feastings. And they would blow trumpets through like a, a chain, like a fire signal. They would blow trumpets all throughout the highway to the northest breadth and the southest tip of Israel. It was a celebration. The high priest's sacrifice was not rejected. He went in and he came back alive. Being the firstborn from the dead is Jesus' claim, is John's claim to Jesus' priestly office. He went in to the dead. He went in to the grave. He went into the realm of death and he came out alive. He is the high priest who makes successful atonement. Hebrews 9, again, says this. When Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not the ones made with hands, that is nothing in this creation, so think heaven now, he entered once for all into the holy places, not with the means of bloods of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood. You say, he didn't die in the holy place. He was put out of the city. He was nowhere near the temple. Yes, this is speaking about the holy place, that the earthly holy place was shadowing, that Moses saw and drew the blueprint. This was actual heaven Jesus went into, having made atonement on the cross, thus securing an eternal redemption. Not one year to re-enter the holy place next year. One eternal redemption. Because he went with his own blood, not into the temple, but into heaven. Verse 24. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, but into heaven itself. Now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Jesus is the great and ultimate and last high priest. And then Revelation 1 verse 5 says, he is firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. This is so simple. This is so clear in the New Testament. This is one of the main themes of the apostolic message was you killed him, God raised him, now he's Lord and Savior of Israel. You killed him, God raised him, now he's at God's right hand to give repentance. You killed him, God raised him, now he is the champion and Savior of all. You killed him, God raised him, now he is inheriting the kingdom, as Psalm 110 says, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. 
Ephesians 1 says that he was raised and given the, ra- the, the, the place above all rule and authority, higher than every other name. Uh, Philippians says that he has inherited the name at the sound of which all knees will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. This is a main theme in the book of Revelation as well, that Jesus is not just a king alongside other kings like David. He was not a king who later, uh, uh, 700 years or so later, there would arise this glorious empire, the Roman Empire, that would put David's kingdom, to be honest, to shame. Rename it. Put it, to, put it under subjugation. Threaten them with bringing pig's blood into their holy temple. I mean, this is not the kind of kingdom that Jesus has. Jesus has a, a kingdom that would not be uh, usurped by later pagan kings or other demonic rules and rulers and authorities, but a kind of kingdom that is insurmountable and untouchable because he's on the heavenly Zion that no earthly king can topple or approach. Jesus is the king of kings. Revelation 19 verse 16 says, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Psalm 89 reminded us that he is the highest of the kings of the earth, and John applies that phrase directly to Jesus presently. He is the king of kings kings and lord of lords and as such he can protect us and he can lead us perfectly to fulfill God's plan for us. One of the relationships between people and king in the Old Testament was as the king goes so goes the people. You had a good king bringing in reforms then the people would repent such was the spiritual relationship that God would bless the people through the king. You had an idolatrous, adulterous king, the people would follow and swing because the king, I mean, the law sat there, but the law was somewhat powerless unless the king enforced the law. Uh, The weaponry of Israel and the promises of God for defense, they sat there kind of idle unless the king devoted himself to God and took up those weapons and did God's warfare. Then only then could he walk in the promises and only then would the people be protected. If, If the king was lazy, the promises fell flat and the people were massacred. If the king was idolatrous, the people were distracted and cursed by God for their idolatry. But Jesus is that perfect king who having made purification purification for sins, has sat down at God's right hand and perfectly saves all of his people from their enemies, saves all of his people from their sins, saves them from the demonic, tyrannical, satanic reign of paganism, philosophies, New Ageism, etc., every other religion ruled and influenced by demons, human despotic, tyrannical rulers and kings who claim to be half God, half man, Jesus saves us from them and brings us into his kingdom, perfectly protects us, and does not distract us through idolatry, but leads us. This is why no true Christian will ever lose their salvation, because Jesus isn't a failure of a king. He gets us home. He guards the borders. He protects his family, and he brings us to his father. So as perfect prophet and priest, and king, glorious upon all glory, marvelous upon all comprehension, what does that three-in-one magnificent mediator do? Verse 5 tells us. He loves us. To him, Jesus, the prophet, the priest, the king, to him who loves us. Is that where you think Revelation was going to go with all its fire and brimstone? It starts here. This Jesus loves you. He has loved us. And the effect of that love is inexplainable. To him who loves us, present tense loves. Not loved, not generically loved. And, uh, uh, you know, whoever wants to make good on salvation, personally loved from the foundation of the world, all those who would believe in him. Loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory. Look at, oh, well, you don't need to go there. I'll read it quickly. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 5 goes on to tell us the effect of Jesus' priestly, kingly, prophetical rule. 
First Peter, uh, this is Peter who learned from Jesus. He's writing to Christians and says, there is something that Jesus has done in us now and for us and through us. Here's what he's done. Verse 5 says, we are now a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So the sacrificial system is done away with now, but we still offer spiritual sacrifices by way of worship, by way of offerings, by way of service to Jesus Christ, fulfilling of the Great Commission. Uh, Paul even sees his evangelistic activities, right? Taking a tract, putting it in a letterbox. You know what that's like? That's like taking a sacrifice, burning it on the altar, and God loves the smell of it. God loves to see it. I wonder if any of you handed out a tract this afternoon. God loves to see it. A sacrifice acceptable to God. He's, he, that's temple language, priesthood language, at sacrifice language. We're priests. Peter goes on to say that we are a chosen race. That's like the Abrahamic race, the Jews of the Old Testament. We are now all believers in Jesus, Jew and Gentile. We are now a nation, a spiritual nation. We are a royal priesthood, back on the priesthood, but says, but we're also kingly priests. Oh, yeah. Priests in the Old Testament were Levites, kings were Judahites. We are sons of David in Jesus and sons of Levi in Jesus, royal priests. He goes on to say, we are a holy nation, a set-apart chosen nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's what Revelation 1 says as well. Look at verse 6 that he made us a kingdom, present tense, priests to his God and Father to fulfill the priestly work now by offering sacrifices and to praying for the people, kings and all people of the world, that they might convert to Jesus Christ. Do you realize that in the last fortnight, as you were praying for the Solomon Islands mission trip, you were fulfilling a priestly office as a Christian? Offering those people upon the altar of God that he might be merciful and accept them in Jesus Christ's blood. Your evangelistic efforts are sacrifices as a priesthood would do so that we may proclaim. That's what Peter sees. That's what Revelation 1 sees. We are a priesthood to God, a kingdom, priest to God and his father, so to Jesus be all the glory. But of course there is the linchpin and the hinge of it all at the end of verse 5 which we skipped. How is it that this threefold office Jesus, prophet, priest, and king, how is it that he makes us a kingdom of priests so that our whole life can be marked by acceptable service to God? How does he do that? The answer, obviously, he loves us and sets us free from our sins by his blood. Can I give you a a brief uh, spattering of Old Testament and New Testament verses to remind to us that sin is not just a legal status in the Bible. There's much of that. I preach much of that. It is condemnation for guilt. It is breaking God's law. It is a crime. It is an illegality. It is an illicit act. There's that. That's that criminal level of sin. But sin is also pictured as things like an infection and a sickness, a death and a terminal disease, an enemy and and a master, a tyrant, Sin is, for our purposes tonight, also pictured as a burden weighing down like a yoke upon people's backs, like you might read of in John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. A great heavy load. I've been to Nepal and Burma and India, and I've seen old women and young children, as well as strong men, they handle it better, carry huge baskets of brick, Sometimes it's twigs for the fire or leaves, but the the heartbreaking ones to see are are the crooked backs that even with the basket taken off, they cannot walk straight, they cannot stand up, broken down, bended, almost crippled by their continual labor of carrying these burdens, and that's one of the pictures of sin in the Bible. You're, you're, You're near crippled, you are weighed down, you are trapped, the boa constrictor has wrapped itself around you, the chains and the muck and the mire and the seaweed is engulfed you and is pulling you down. There is a freedom that is necessary. For example, Genesis 4, 7, God says to Cain that sin is crouching at the door and its desire is to have you, but you must rule over it. 2 Peter 2.19 says, 
whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. If you can amen that. Maybe, maybe you right now, or maybe you can remember before you were converted. That sin, there were sins that you tried to put away and you couldn't. You simply couldn't. And you're right, you couldn't. Without the Holy Spirit, without Jesus' life in you, you cannot overcome sin. Only the Son sets us free. That there is addictions or substances or actions or, 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 or mindsets that you simply could not break free of. And you just thought, maybe when I'm out of my teenage years, maybe when I'm just a bit older, I mean, eventually this will stop. I'm not this evil thing for my whole life, am I? Yes. Yes, you are. Until sin is taken off of you and you are freed by Jesus Christ. There is no freedom from the habits of sin. Psalm 38 verse 4 says it well. My iniquities have gone up over my head. He's drowning in them. Have you ever, maybe you remember almost drowning one time, maybe you were wrestling with friends and they were holding you under, maybe you slipped and you had a, a large bag on your back as you're crossing a river. I, I, I remember some instances of that and, and that feeling. I wonder if you can imagine that gut feeling you have as you're tippy-toeing to just try and get your lips above the level of the water and you're holding your breath and you're sure that death is engulfing you. You know that feeling? That's what David says sins are like. They're encompassing me. I can't get my mouth high enough to take another gulp of air. Like a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. They're pulling me down like a weight beneath the waters. Proverbs 5, 22. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. John 8, 34. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, Everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Therefore, the scripture shows to us that sin doesn't just need to be forgiven. We don't just need to be cleansed and brought near. God doesn't just need to be propitiated, but we need to be liberated from the chains and the cords and the burden of sin. I could say it this way. If you're not freed from sin and Jesus comes back, you won't be glorified. You can't. Glorification is a release and an escape of all deathliness and curse, and you won't be freed if you are not now freed. Death still holds you. Death still awaits you. Damnation is still over you if you are not now free of sin. Justly and rightly and legally, you cannot be free from damnation unless you are free of sin. Therefore, God's, as God's liberated people, you have freedom. Freedom from condemnation. Freedom from future punishment. Freedom from the fear of God. Freedom from the fear of man and made up stupid standards we put on each other. Freedom from demonic influence, demonic lies and demonic attacks. And freedom from sin's powerful control and grip. Freedom in biblical language, liberation is proclaimed for slaves and captives because of the resurrection and reign and atonement of Jesus, the prophet, priest, and king. His blood enacts a freedom. That is why I, I love this connection in Scripture. In Leviticus 16, the day of atonement is described. We went all the way through it before. and The, the high priest comes out and then everybody knows the sacrifice was accepted. Every 50th day of atonement, his entrance, his exit from the holy place will be marked with trumpets that we mentioned before throughout the whole nation. And that noise was a command and a herald and a news to everybody that if you are a captive slave or if you are in indentured servitude to a master, walk home. You're done. It's the year of Jubilee. Meaning, the year, every 50th year in Israel, the year of liberation. That's why Jesus, in his first sermon, preached upon Isaiah's words. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's 
favour in Jesus, there is an eternal year of jubilee. You can be freed from your sins. Come home to Jesus Christ. In John 8, Jesus says, If the Son sets you free by His blood, by the proclamation, right now, this is a human version of a trumpet on the day of Jubilee. The high priest is alive. Jesus is resurrected. You can be free. Walk on home. All you need to do is believe God's promise. The Son sets you free that way by believing the gospel. Jesus died for me. I'm free. Jesus died for me. I'm liberated. I have freedom in his blood. And if the sun sets you free through the belief in the gospel, then you are free indeed, the Bible says. Jesus says you are free indeed. So what silly nonsense it is to speak about Christians who still live in their sin because we're under grace now. You've heard nothing more nonsensical and silly than that. I don't need to be holy. I don't need to live God's law. I'm a Christian. I'm under grace. No, you're not. You don't have the forgiving benefits of Jesus' blood. Hear this. You do not have the benefits of Jesus' blood for forgiveness, grace, and mercy if they have not been, if you have not been set free by that blood. Don't claim that I'm speaking of some silly nonsense about perfection. Just freedom. Progressive, incremental, growing freedom. At least a freedom from the stupidity that says, I don't need to obey Jesus, I'm under grace. No, you're not. If you have been forgiven by his blood, atoned for, propitiated, purchased, bought, brought near spiritually, then you have been freed from your sins and they do not have reigning power over you. That is why Paul can command in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee from sexual immorality. There's no room there to say, I can't. You can say, I don't want to. God, please forgive me. God, please give me a heart that wants to. It's okay to say, no, I'm going to hell. The sexually immoral don't inherit the kingdom of God. It's fine to say that to your own damnation. Don't blaspheme Jesus by saying his blood is ineffectual for you to free you from your sins. This is good news. Don't hear a condemnation. You are able to walk free from and flee from sexual sin. 1 Corinthians 10. No temptation has overcome you that is not common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he also provides a way of escape so that you may be able to endure it. Therefore, flee from idolatry. Application of freedom from the blood of, by the blood of Jesus, freedom from our sins is? Stop sinning, friends. Any known sin you have, and there will always be unknown sins, and Jesus will tell us about that in time to come as the days go by. We're never done this repentance business. But any known sin, you are told, walk free from it. You are free from it in Jesus' blood. James can tell us in chapter 4, verse 7, resist the devil. Ever heard that? I've heard it as a pastor. Flee from sexual sin. The devil made me do it. We'll resist the devil. Well, oh, gotcha. <laughs> the gospel's better than we let it be sometimes. The gospel is better. You are freed experientially, not just legally from condemnation, not just uh, eternally from wrath. You are freed experientially from the power of sin over your life You are set free by the blood of Jesus so that you can be his royal kingdom of priests who serve him and make acceptable sacrifices to him. Jesus Christ alone, his perfect life and his death on the cross is what makes captives set free. So if you're not a believer in Jesus up until now, or you thought that the Jesus you worshipped let you remain in sin, I'm telling you now, you dialed the wrong number. That's not the real Jesus. That's a spiritual eternal scammer. He's hacked your accounts. That's not the real Jesus. If he said, please send me your eternal security details, there you are, you're forgiven, you're going to heaven, live in sin all you like, that was Satan. You worship Satan. As Jesus says in John 8, in that very context, your father is Satan. You're not going to heaven. Not if you stay enslaved to sin. But if right now you believe that in Jesus' death, 
you are freed from your condemnation by his death. That in his resurrection, you are freed from the wrath to come because he has secured eternal life for you. If you believe that in his glorious rule and reign, he can grant mercy to you because there's no authority higher than him. He can grant pardon to you. He can bring you into his father's kingdom and he can bring you safely to an eternal abode in the new heaven and the new earth. If you believe that, then your sins are forgiven. You must know you are free from sin and he commands and compels you to live like it. For all of us who have received Jesus, let us glory in the liberation that his blood brings. Let's pray. Jesus Christ, the firstborn from the dead, the faithful witness, the ruler of kings on earth, you have loved us. You have loved us. You have loved us. What glory there is in those simple words. You have loved us. You do love us. You love us and gave yourself for us. You shed your own blood upon the altar of the law, upon God's holy, heavenly place. You, you entered in, having died the death for sin, and you received the smile of your Father and were sent back to this earth that we might know that the high priest has made an atonement. Father God, we thank you that you sent your Son to be this propitiation for our sins, to be the Son of God, the King, the Ruler, the Son of David, our King, our Priest, and our Prophet. We thank you, Jesus, that you came willingly, you fulfilled everything that all the, the previous humans had failed to fulfill, all the future, uh, previous prophets and priests and kings had fallen short of, you accomplished. And thank you that by your Holy Spirit, you enter us into that kingdom. You make us priests to serve God because you free us from the power and the reign and the grip and the tentacles and the burden and the cords and the chains of sin. Father God, would you make this truth not only apprehended by us, which would lead us to doxology and worship, but believed by us so that we might walk this week free of habitual sin. We pray this in the name of our prophet, priest, and king. Jesus Christ. Everybody said...